It's midnight, and we're driving on the south island of Taiwan, just off China. We are searching for an area where we heard military exercises will take place. It's closed. September 14th, 2021. The 37th annual military exercise will begin at daybreak. Usually a looming presence, the media are limited by the Taiwanese army due to COVID regulations this year. We are confined to this section of the road. Journalists vie for the best spots. Not far from the press, tents set up on the asphalt. Friends drinking and even families with their children are ready to spend a sleepless night here. All of them wait in line, patriotism in their blood. These high school students from Taipei, the capital, wouldn't dream of missing the event. I just compare it to this year and last year. What are you going to do with the pictures? Uh, just upload to the uh, Instagram and let everyone know uh, Taiwan's defense power. Why is it important to show defense power? Uh, we, we want the world to know we are a country, not, not same to the People's Republic of China. TVBS, the top private news channel, has the best location in the early morning. We follow Ting Ting Liu, its star reporter. We are going to go to a better vantage point. Are you the only one who has this around here? Uh, there are a couple of other media outlets who also rent this kind of platform. So you can see over there. A few hundred meters away, a fictional scenario is about to play out before our eyes. The airports have just been destroyed by the Chinese army. The Taiwanese must urgently commandeer the highway to take off and land their fighter jets. A strange scene attracts our attention. Soldiers have exchanged their weapons for shovels and brushes. This photographer, who is used to grand displays, has never seen this before. To avoid accidents, they ensure the highway is as smooth as an airport runway in less than half an hour. The military demonstrations can begin. Taiwan's major television stations are broadcasting the event live. The military is also providing close-up footage. Fighter planes, radar planes, and pilots salute a special guest of honor. The president of Taiwan, Tsai Ing-wen, the first woman elected to head the country. She dressed in her uniform as chief of the armed forces for the occasion. In the south of the country, these demonstrations of force are over, but these grand exercises last three days and have been going on since 1984. The army films these real-life exercises, for example, how they would counter a possible Chinese landing. These exercises are designed to flex its muscles to other countries, specifically Taiwan's long-standing neighboring rival, China. Few people know it, but today, the entire planet depends on Taiwan, a small, mountainous and heavily forested island. With its 23 million inhabitants, the island, very close to the Chinese coast, 
is home to the global leader in electronic chips, TSMC, the least known of the world's most influential companies. The automotive industry, computers, smartphones, game consoles, no industry can go without Taiwanese electronic components, making the small island more attractive and richer than ever. Taiwan has the most Louis Vuitton store per, per population in the world. A flourishing economy, one of the most important seaports in Asia, exemplary management of the COVID pandemic, Taiwan is now growing at a rate of 6%, one of the best on the planet. Despite this success, Taiwan is in a unique situation in the world. It's not considered an official country. It has a flag, an anthem, a currency, a president and a government, but no major power officially recognizes it. The reason being its complicated relationship with China. Since 1949, the communist regime established by Mao refused to accept that his great adversary, Chiang Kai-shek, retreated to Taiwan and founded his own state. The People's Republic of China has never recognized Taiwan and still considers it one of its own provinces. Even today, Chinese President Xi Jinping does not rule out getting it back one day, even if it means going to war. In order not to aggravate China, the vast majority of Taiwanese people have chosen to adopt the round-back tactic, a way to maintain peace and continue to do business. But this policy has a price, no official independence. But in Taiwan, some people, including a majority of young people, are increasingly demonstrating for independence, even if it means China cracking down. Freedom of press, recognition of gay marriage, accessible social networks, the right to protest, a highly participatory democracy with a well-connected transgender minister. In the capital, Taipei, the population almost exclusively opposes China's dictatorship and has no desire to be reunified, except for a very small part of the population for whom Taiwan is still China. Here, the MPs are playing hard rock and former bad boys are causing a gang war between those for independence and those for reunification. How do the Taiwanese cope with this unique situation? Taiwan, all the makings of a country, yet officially it is not one. An investigation into the last bastion still standing up to the Chinese giant. In Taiwan, the majority of the population has only one objective, for nothing to change. Wayne is one of those Taiwanese people who don't want to provoke China, but who don't want reunification either. Rather conservative, Wayne, 41 years old with two children, lives in an upscale area of the capital, and for him, Taiwan is a safe country that must remain so. You know, we don't have shootings all the time, we don't have, you know, I hate to say we don't have jihadists, you know, trying to blow themselves up. You know, uh, we have freedom of speech, we have a very democratic society, our national health care. I mean, I'll tell you a secret. A lot of my friends who live in America would fly to Taiwan to do their health check. It's overall a good place to live, you know, and uh, I welcome French people to come to Taiwan. <laughs> Seriously, it's a great country. <laughs> If everything is going well in the life of this family man, it's because he is part of the wealthiest 1% of the island, and also because he works in business with China. This Taiwanese businessman runs six English language schools, including one located in China. Today, driving his luxury electric sedan, he has a phone appointment with the Chinese school's principal. 
。没有，我是问问你一下，最近那个有。那个最近学生怎么样？最近学生挺好，最近有几个新的学生来试听。我现在就是老师基本没时间了，因为。This Chinese school represents ten percent of Wayne's business, so it's easy to see why the businessman doesn't want to offend Beijing. Wayne does business with the Chinese giant, an essential source of profit for Taiwan's economy. Over forty percent of their exports go to China. Can't hear you. Let's get dancing. Break free. Okay, go. I'll I'll be going up soon. Okay. This morning, Wayne accompanies his daughter to one of the six schools he runs. It's about、uh, four thirty in the afternoon. They come to our school after their Chinese school to get a U.S. curriculum. If we were to calculate our students'、uh, class time throughout the day, plus our program, it would be longer than adults' full-time working schedule. So Taiwanese kids work very hard. Most Taiwanese parents actually aim for U.S. In Taiwan, only five percent of families can afford to send their children to these English-speaking schools. Wayne heads to his mother's apartment, where he goes every day to check on the business at hand. She's the boss here. Thirty years ago, Lisa created the six schools. She entrusted the management to her son, but she's in control, and she doesn't mess around with money. Six months, you have to send tuition. No, no. We are talking about the first semester, from March to March. Oh, March to March. Yes. Today, Lisa had two bankers come to the house. With four million dollars in sales a year, she wants to know the best stock market investments. For Lisa and her son, business is booming, and politics need not disrupt anything. But now, now, if the people 人民已经习惯这样子的生活方式呢，也很好嘛，大家安居乐业。那你想要买什么，你想吃什么，台湾人民都一都 OK， 都可以满足他自己。可是如果我们去变成台独或是统独这两个问题存在的话，可能有一些人会反对，有一些人不会反对，那就引起台湾人民的生的人民。Another smoothly run meeting by this businesswoman, who has always known how to run things. Okay, how? Bye bye. In Taiwan, no one wants to lose their lifestyle and freedom, but they still want to do business with China. In short, the Taiwanese want all the advantages of the economic power of the communist regime without the disadvantages of its dictatorship. That's why I am pro status quo because、uh, when it comes to it, I do not want to risk my business. I do not want to risk my my family.、Um, and you know, some people ask me, "Oh, Taiwan is not recognized." So what? I don't care because、um, my the Taiwanese passport、um, uh, that I use, you know. We could travel every, everywhere. You know, it, it, let's be honest. You, you compare the Taiwanese passport versus the People's Republic of China passport.、Um, the Taiwanese passport can go more places than the China passport. This fragile situation, where the Taiwanese have to bend over backwards not to irk their neighboring rival, how much longer can it go on? Especially since some people here can't stand it any longer. This is the case for Roy, a young 25-year-old pro-independence supporter, who would like things to change in Taiwan. I, I feel, I, 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 I,
he heads to his apartment where his girlfriend is waiting for him. Hey, baby, welcome. The couple lives in this three-room apartment that belongs to Roy's grandmother. He met Wang Wei four years ago at a political meeting. Wang Wei is Taiwanese by father and Chinese by mother. Sometimes it bothers her. Wang Wei's mother is worried about her daughter being with a Taiwanese man. Roy and Wang Wei agree on one thing, Taiwan must become independent. To get this independence, Roy is even willing to face China if he has to. But does Roy understand the Chinese threat to Taiwan? This is what the Chinese arsenal looks like. Propaganda images that aim to impress even terrify the Taiwanese. Nevertheless, the Chinese army is much more powerful than that of the small island. $252 billion military budget on one side, 12 billion on the other. 2,200,000 soldiers here, 160,000 there. 348 ships for China, 86 for Taiwan, 2,050 planes for Beijing, 400 for Taipei. Disproportionate military forces, but also a war of nerves orchestrated by Beijing. Every day, Chinese warplanes like this nuclear-capable H-6 are sent into Taiwanese airspace. In 2021, there were over 600 incursions into the sky. Not enough to weaken the determination of the Taiwanese government. At the highest level of the state, they say they are ready to fight in case of war with China. Foreign Minister Joseph Wu is adamant. We have been preparing is that we have the ability to defend ourselves, even if it's going to happen tomorrow. So we are trying to make ourselves ready for a possible conflict with China. And I want to say again, we have the determination to defend ourselves. This is our territory, this is our sovereignty, and this is our way of life, and we want to protect it. The minister sounds confident, but others think Taiwan is not ready. 
On this retired officer's shoulders, 41 military medals, the crowning achievement of 38 years of loyal service in the Taiwanese Air Force. That day, the Lieutenant General came to alert journalists about the obsolescence of the Mirage 2000s that Taiwan bought from France 30 years ago. For him, one thing is certain, they are no longer a match for the Chinese fighter planes. But apart from a few television stations, his grand declarations have not mobilized the Taiwanese. Taiwan's military must better prepare for a Chinese offensive, especially since on the civilian side, more and more young people are challenging Beijing's ascendancy, thus taking the risk of triggering their enemy brother's temper. March 18, 2014, the Taiwanese called it the Sunflower Movement. On that day, tens of thousands of students invaded parliament. Their goal? To put an end to the free trade agreement between China and Taiwan that would have resulted in Beijing controlling the island's economy. At that time, the Kuomintang, a pro-Chinese party, ruled the country and wanted to pass this agreement without consulting the population. 23 days of protest ensued. The young people mobilized for the first time with strength and determination. As a result of the Sunflower Movement, President Tsai Ing-wen of the Democratic Progressive Party was elected in 2016. The old guard of the Kuomintang was defeated after dominating the political scene that had existed since 1949. At the executive headquarters, we have an appointment with a participant of the Sunflower Movement appointed for the second time as Minister of Digital Affairs by the President of Taiwan. Audrey Tang, 40, goes by the nickname The Digital Woman. She is the only transgender minister in the world, and this former hacker claims radical transparency. Is this an interview? If it's an interview, I need to turn on my camera. Nothing the Minister of Digital Affairs says to the press eludes Taiwanese citizens. Our interview will be broadcast in full on her YouTube channel. This champion of communication also posts all her government messages there. Yeah, basically I just speak my mind, so that's no um, extra training required, I guess. Uh, but, of course, a lot of the actual work is, of course, also a group effort. I think my main contribution as an individual is to insist that the materials uh, forming the message and also the medium um, is delivered as creative commons. Today, the minister must encourage citizens to buy online vouchers offered by the state. The goal? To revive the country's consumption after the COVID crisis. In contrast to serious Chinese communications, in the TV studio of the Taiwanese ministry, Audrey Tang shows her personality, and here it is. Fun mini musicals made in teams in just a few hours. Wow! Young people love it. It's colorful, fun, and popular. Nothing better for an institutional message. As a result, the digital minister has set up another unique tool in the world, the platform Gov Zero a platform of citizen deliberation where Taiwanese participate online in the development of laws. Each citizen can intervene whenever they want to change something.
Ultra-participatory democracy is the bright side of Audrey Tang's work. But less funny, she also has to face Chinese pressure. Every day, Taiwan suffers 500,000 cyber attacks, choreographed by Beijing. In May 2020, hackers paralyzed the payment system of a national oil company for several days. The Taiwanese couldn't get gasoline. It was chaos. To protect Taiwan from similar attacks, the Minister of Digital Technology has set up a team of white hat hackers. Make sure that we also understand so-called red team thinking, how the penetration testers think about the system so we can defend ourselves better and also proactively hunt any threats. The CEO of Team 5, a company specialized in cyber intelligence, knows these Chinese hackers well. They even identified them during the attack on oil companies. They are the APT-41 group. Chinese hackers known worldwide and wanted by the FBI. They have very um, high skill. They are really good at cyber attack. And according to our record, our research, we know them did um, compromise lots of very large enterprises and very, um, very important critical infrastructures and uh, some like technology companies. Yep. APT-41 are mercenaries, sometimes working for mafias and sometimes for states like China. The day of the attack is very close to um, Taiwan, our presidential our inauguration ceremony. So uh, many people guess uh, it might be uh, related. They want to cause some uh, impact because not only this company, um, uh, it happened to uh, two major uh, oil um, uh, product providers in Taiwan. Amongst Taiwan's fears are that the country's electricity and water infrastructure would also be hacked, bringing the entire country to a complete standstill. Some of these hackers are operating from the 311 base in the city of Fuzhou in China. Base 311 is the headquarters of the Chinese army's cyber attacks. Nearby is an archipelago of Taiwanese islands, including the Kinmen Islands, from which China is close by and visible, only 30 minutes away by boat. Chinese attacks are feared here more than anywhere else in Taiwan. As evidence of this, these anti-disembarkation stakes, vestiges of the fight which took place between Mao's communists and Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists in 1949. Robin has been a guide here for two years. He is Taiwanese. So when I got here about three days, three nights, attacking with just Kimmen, with called the ROC troops. So they sent us for 900 boats at the same time, the night time, two o'clock, attacking to Kimmen for three days. A battle that ended in victory for Taiwan, at the time militarily stronger than China. Robin wants to show us the tanks that participated in this battle. Today, an open-air museum. Usually it's packed with people, but since Covid, not a single tourist has visited. A curious monument is also worth a visit in Kinmen. That afternoon, Technicians in a gondola came to repair this high concrete wall with the mission to repair some of the 48 loudspeakers that play a song by Teresa Teng. <laughs> Teresa Teng, a kind of Chinese Edith Piaf, very popular in the country's history. During the Cold War, her songs were used as a propaganda tool to try to convince communists to come and join them. And according to Robin, this sweet melody was heard all the way to the other side and could have attracted Chinese to make their journey to Taiwan. Some soldier really coming to get here, want to pursue the, the coming to catch that from the democracy. Some soldiers do that way, they swam to here and to me they surrender, want to join us. 
Back to Taipei, where we see another threat to Taiwan at the time. Precisely from the main opposition party, the Kuomintang, the oldest Taiwanese party. This conservative and above all pro-Chinese party is constantly putting obstacles in the way of the new ruling power. Freddie Lim is a young deputy close to the government, elected after the arrival of Tsai Ing-wen, the president. So where are we here, Freddie? Uh, we are at Sansui Sichang, which is a market that uh, uh, built in Japanese colonial period, period, almost 100 years. This little market is located in a historic district of Taipei, the congressman's stronghold a constituency that he won from the Kuomintang for the second time in the last legislative elections. The deputy came to support small merchants whose businesses have suffered due to COVID. Online shopping here doesn't exist, and Freddie would like to see them get started. The traditional shops, they uh, they got used to the traditional way, physical way, but uh, during the epidemic, uh, they have been uh, cracked down mostly, so how they can thrive back, that's very important. Freddie Lim, a father, takes advantage of being at the market to do his shopping. <laughs> Normally, uh, me and my wife, we shop here. This is one of the most famous dumpling shop in this area. If Freddie Lim seems in his element when he's among his constituents, it's because he's appreciated for his politics. But not only that, the MP has a particular skill. Freddie, 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 very famous. Hi, why famous, why? <laughs> sing, sing a song. <laughs> it's more famous as a singer or as a politician? <laughs> oh, yeah, don't, don't okay. Don't. Both. Leader of the most famous rock band in Taiwan, The politician is barely recognizable under the makeup. Tonight, he sings in front of 20,000 people. He also takes the opportunity to deliver a message to the crowd, a pro-independence message that strongly displeases the Kuomintang, the Conservative Party. Since Freddie Lim's election as a member of parliament, the Kuomintang is doing everything it can to take its constituency back. The Conservative Party is even trying to remove him from office by accusing him of mismanaging the Covid crisis, but without success. The MP takes us to the parliament to tell us how the Kuomintang went as far as physically assaulting him in the middle of a voting session. This is the Taiwanese National Assembly and its 113 seats. 在前面那幾排主要是內閣就cabinet的成員會在那邊,然後在下面的這幾排的話主要就是parliament members在這裡。那我自己的位置是在後面,在你非常難拍到的地方,原因很簡單,就是因為我不喜歡被拍到,所以我就選了那個位置。of course when he's on stage. On the other hand, it was right here in the parliament building itself that Freddie Lim was pushed around by his opponents. To prevent him from voting, his political opponents here in blue went as far as jumping on him, grabbing and restraining him. Shocking images. In Taiwan, however, this kind of scene between real fight and overplayed spectacle is commonplace. It's a way for MPs to show that they're taking action. 
But young MPs, like Freddie Lim, don't like it at all. Especially since they also inspired fighting and security didn't even intervene. Disturbing for what's supposed to be a democracy. I think they can't sell their their idea about being closing with China. So so how how they can position themselves? They found it just so difficult. So they they it might be easier for them to go extreme and to get attention from the people. But that's for us. Well, I don't think it makes sense. But but they just do that. In Taiwan, the Kuomintang is not the only political party that threatens democracy. There is also the Coup an extremist pro-Chinese party. Its activists are very few, but they know how to make themselves heard. On their vests, embroidered in yellow, their message is very clear, for the reunification with China. That day, Mr. Chang and his comrades came to demonstrate for the 122nd time in front of the disease management center. Their demand is always the same. They demand that the Taiwanese government buy Chinese vaccines, which are the least effective on the world market. Despite their disciplined approach, these kinds of demonstrations would be suppressed in China as protests are banned. A paradox that these activists ignore, concentrated on their rehearsed message. After an hour of protesting, the police intervene. The activists of the coup comply and leave the scene of the demonstration in a calm and orderly fashion. We take the opportunity to follow Mr. Chang to his headquarters, a few kilometers from Taipei. As we enter his office, we discover how the coup is the armed forces of China on Taiwanese territory, which could be dangerous for its democracy. Our first surprise was upon entering the coup office and gazing upon this statue of the former Chinese communist leader, Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping was close to Mao in the 1950s and was responsible for the Tiananmen crackdown 40 years later. But what Mr. Chang is most proud of, and what he absolutely wants to show us, is this flag. In the next room, Coup propaganda films are being made. The morning's demonstration will soon be online. Provocative footage that this man in the blue tracksuit supervises. He seems to have a certain power. The man quickly intrigues us as he seems to follow the second in command of the party everywhere he goes. This is the President of the United States, and this is his son, Zhang Wei. We suspected that this man was important. In his absence, his father, the Coup president, delegated all his power to him. But the shadow of his father, who is currently in China on business, is constantly looming. This is a 
抓他回来台湾以后送给他的，给他当纪念品。对，那他的形象是一匹仰天朝向的狼，因为我父亲的绰号就叫白狼。White Wolf. It sounds like something out of an adventure novel, but this nickname dates back to the time when his father ran a very dangerous Taiwanese mafia gang, the Bamboo Gang. His father also spent 10 years in prison in the United States for drug trafficking and for complications with the Taiwanese justice for accepting Chinese money to create the Coup, which is his political party, and moreover the Trojan horse of Beijing. He tries to convince us that he is different as he was raised in Argentina by his mother. Hence the rest of the interview is conducted in Spanish. La primera vez que yo encontré con mi padre, yo ya tengo 20, 20 años. Él está en la cárcel de los Estados Unidos. Yo conozco a mi padre, la mayoría es por media, por uh, newspaper. Yo sé que él es mi padre y pasó algo, pero nunca le, lo vi. Yo no participé al uh, gangster porque mi padre me prohibió. Today, his father lives between China and Taiwan. And his son may not be in a gang, but in Taiwan three years ago, he beat up pro-independence protesters and was sentenced to 40 days in jail. Could he have inherited his father's brutal methods from the time he ran the bamboo gang, the Taiwanese mafia? We meet a former member of this bamboo gang, who after managing to leave it, has completely turned around and become a loyal pro-independence man. The man now feels much more free and less surveyed. Today, he is the head of six gyms. Holger Chen, 43 years old, still has a bad boy look, but also has left the bamboo gang. He is now a businessman and an internet star with over one million subscribers. I 不然遇到不好的人,你就是這樣不好的去去跟他對嘛,對不對?那我個人喜歡很喜歡骷髏頭的東西. However, in 2020, Holger Chen didn't use his bad side and instead paid dearly for his newfound determination for a free and independent Taiwan. He even made the headlines. 最新画面带你来看到稍早为您报道过馆长全之汉在金陵城金船被人开枪他的手臂跟腿部一共中了三枪我很糟糕我的脚因为那时候我全身上下有七个弹孔然后蛮严重的那时候是蛮严重差点
PTI News will stop broadcasting after nearly three decades. Authorities have accused the owner, Tycoon Tsai Ing-ming, of uh, interfering with the broadcaster's editorial independence. An investigation led to the arrest of two of Holger Chen's attackers. They were sentenced to 16 and 18 years in prison. But the businessman turned pro-independent supporter is still threatened and lives surrounded by bodyguards. Holger Chen is not the only one threatened by pro-Chinese extremists. There are also political exiles, those who have fled recently under Chinese rule from Hong Kong. Lam Wing Ki is one of these Hong Kong refugees in Taiwan, someone that China hates. Lam Wing Ki is a bookseller, and above all, he sells books that criticize Beijing. This earned him eight months in prison in China. Today, the Chinese police are searching for him once again, as he refuses to denounce his customers. A refugee in Taiwan, which has no extradition agreement with China, Lam Wing Ki opened his new bookstore in 2020 with the blessing of Tsai In Wen. The president of Taiwan even stuck up a note saying, Free Taiwan supports the freedom of Hong Kong. A simple piece of paper that's still there today. A provocation for China where the word freedom, calligraphed and framed here, does not appear in any Chinese bookshop. A provocation that didn't take long to become punishable. Blood-red stains on the wall of this cafe, all over the floor, and on this table. April the 21st, 2020, Lam Wing Ki has red paint all over his body. His attacker, recorded on this security camera, had only one objective, to intimidate this anti-Chinese activist who remains dedicated to his cause. <laughs> Until Lam Wing Ki arrived, Taiwan did not accept any refugees on its soil so as not to offend China, but in 2020, 11,000 Hong Kongers were welcomed. They wanted to escape Beijing's takeover of Hong Kong and the accompanying brutal crackdown. Chinese President Xi Jinping has not respected the principle of one country, two systems in Hong Kong. And this is what frightens the bookseller and all the inhabitants of Taiwan, that the same scenario could happen to this island. Do you believe in the one country, two system, and will Taiwan be the next Hong Kong? Uh, 一个冷气大家也知道了已经是一个神话你明白我叫什么叫神话吗不存在对啊想象出来的东西大家也知道他对香港这个这两年发生的事情没人相信了应该是他只是一个想骗台湾人也想骗全世界的人也骗他自己 Taiwan is the final territory that China wants to take back, back as they believe it belongs to them. Today, the Taiwanese are at a turning point in their history. Will the de facto independence of their country become official 
or on the contrary, will Beijing do everything in their power to annex the small island? This time, will democracy win? <laughs>